All right, you guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so this is breakout session B at 11 a.m., the statewide data dive. My name is Morgan Essary with Partners in Care, and I'll be the host for this, um, this breakout session. I just want to say this, um, this session is being recorded and will be available after the conference. And from there, I guess we'll go ahead and do some introductions. I'll hand it off to Laura Thielen if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Thielen, and I'm the Executive Director of Partners in Care, and we are the lead agency for the HMIS, Homeless Management Information System on, for the island of Oahu, as well as the lead for the Coordinated Entry System, uh, which Morgan is the lead of for our organization. And I will throw it over to Wallace to introduce them. Hi, uh, I'm Wallace Ingberg. I'm with Partners in Care, um, and I am the lead for the point in time count for Oahu um, and do a lot in regards to our research and data. Sorry, I'll pass it off to Lori. Yeah, great. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Lori Tsuhako, and I am the director of the Department of Housing and Human Concerns for the County of Maui. Um, and I also want to move on to Maud. Good morning. My name is Maud Cumming. I am the executive director for Family Life Center. We have um, offices on Maui and Hawaii, but um, I'm here today as the chair of the data committee for bridging the gap, which is the major island continuum of care. Great, thank you so much, Maud. Thanks, everybody. Okay, I just want to outline one other thing is if you have any questions that arise during this presentation in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, it'll there's a box that says Q and A. So you can go ahead and type your question in there, and then we'll address. We'll have a, a short Q and A session at the end. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, when we were think, contemplating what we were going to be talking about during this session, we were really looking at, at um, the COCs, the continuum of cares for the entire uh, uh, state of Hawaii and, and why we collect data. Uh, and as an outreach worker, in a, uh, I actually still get to do some outreach, so that's fun. Um, but as a former outreach worker, housing navigator, uh, you know, as a social worker, we're, we on the front lines, folks who are on the front lines uh, serving those who are experiencing homelessness, you know, uh, often we question ourselves, you know, why are we collecting this data? Why are we inputting so much information into a database? And so we wanted to address that today because I, I know, uh, as well as my fellow, fellow panelists, that um, data makes a big difference in our world of homeless services. It, uh, it mandates how much funding can come to our state. And it also looks at the efficacy and the uh, just whether or not programs are successful and lets us look deeper into those programs and, and really figure out what, what direction we should be moving in regards to services. Uh, so go ahead to the next slide, Morgan. So from our perspective, we're really looking at a couple of different things with the, the data. And as social workers, as outreach workers, case managers throughout the system, everybody is really focusing on the person that's standing in front of them. And so numbers can never replace the human stories that we all encounter throughout our work. But at the same time, data can help support those stories and help us move in the right direction. So from my perspective as the lead for, for the HMIS for the uh, County of Honolulu, you know, there's a few different things that are really the big picture. Uh, and those are really looking at the HMIS, which stands for the Homeless Management Information System, and the point in time count. These are our two main streams of collecting information and sharing it with our funding uh, partners whether that's uh, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development and our local municipalities, including the city and county of Honolulu, uh, the other counties in the neighbor islands, as well as our state legislature and governor. 
Uh, so we as partners in care are really responsible for maintaining these databases and these uh, data systems. Uh, and what a lot of people do not see is the back end of these uh, events. Now, we've been doing point in time counts for over 20 years at this point, and it really helps us figure out what's going on in our community. But what many people do not understand uh, or they gloss over is that this is a true snapshot in time. And it, it cannot be the only source of information and data that we collect. So when we collect the data for the point in time count at the end of January every year, uh, we are looking at a snapshot to give us an idea of what's going on on a one single day on whatever island in, or county that we are a part of. Uh, the other side of that that adds to that data point is the HMIS system. So during the course of a year for our continuum of care, we could possibly see 10 to 15,000 individuals in our homeless management information system. While during our point in time count, we're seeing somewhere between four and 5,000 folks, numbers of folks out on the streets and on our beaches. So those are very big extremes, but that shows you that uh, you know all data is very important to help educate our funders on what's going on and to also uh, educate ourselves on what is needed, where the gaps may be in services and so on. So some of the other things that you folks may or may not know the acronyms for is obviously HUD is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. That's our federal partner who brings quite a bit of money into our state. Uh, point in time count, PITC. The HIC, this is the housing inventory count. And then there's the LSA, which is the longitudinal survey assessment. I think I've got that wrong. I think the S is something different. Um, so, but I know that we need to do that every year. So these, all of these data points help uh, us figure out and share with the federal government what uh, our needs are in the state and then that goes down into our local funding stream. Go ahead and move forward, Morgan. So when I was an outreach worker, many, 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 many moons ago, it seems like, uh, we started the HMIS um, across the countries. Uh, uh, they started to be developed in each of the COCs. Uh, ours was based on, uh, through the state program and it's still running today and it looks quite different than the HMIS that was in place 20 years ago. And hopefully it's got a lot more detail in it and allows us to collect more important information that we will be sharing with, with all of our providers and our funders. So one of the key components of the HMIS is that we really need to educate and train our providers to use it in the best way possible. And as I'm sure everyone on Oahu knows, uh, Partners in Care uh, is really trying to uh, decrease the numbers of duplicated entries in our HMIS. This has been one of our biggest ongoing problems, and it really uh, messes up our ability to provide services to certain individuals. Because if we have a person within our HMIS system and they have four different files, there's a lack of coordination that's going on, and a lot of things can be missed in that. So when you hear uh, your HMIS lead programs asking you to, to work on the deduplication, it really does affect our overall numbers, but more importantly, it might have make us miss some things in a person's life that may help us to figure out what kind of services they qualify for and what kind of services they've already had that have not worked for whatever reasons so that we can realign their plan and make sure that we're doing what they actually want us to be providing to them. Uh, we've been lucky enough at Partners in Care that we had some funding last year for, uh, to create our computer lab. So this is a really great opportunity for all of our providers to get access to education and training here at our offices or in their own uh, programs. And obviously during COVID, a lot of our things had to change to virtual. Um, and we are lucky enough that we have on our team some great folks who have developed 
over 50 videos to help people train on how to use the HMIS and uh, you know, really allow for uh, COVID not to affect every single part of our, um, our work that we do. Um, and it recognizes that people learn in different ways and some, some folks learn a lot better through a video than they would even in person. So we're lucky to have that. Um, last year, as many of you know, we switched our point in time count to a one day count. And this was based on HUD guidance, but it was also based on the fact that we were moving to a more digital platform. Um, so, uh, and we'll talk a lot more about this uh, within the next couple of weeks. You know, looking at the point in time count for 2021, what are we going to do? Are we going to continue with a count? Are we going to have a, um, uh, a more formalized count from the HMIS or are what priorities are going to be most important for making that decision. Um, and by far the most important part of making that final decision on whether or not we are going to do a point in time count in 2021 is the safety of all of our counters and those that we are um, well, working with out in the community. So health and safety are our biggest um, concerns, and we take that very seriously. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll be sharing with all of our partners on what we are going to do in regards to the point in time count. But luckily, because we moved to digital last year, we were able to, uh, you know, we're able to capture more than we have in the past. So that's wonderful. So some of the small picture focuses also that we're looking at is we can track trends. And we recently worked with uh, Anna Pruitt uh, from the University of Hawaii and Wallace, who's our research analyst. Uh, and they were able to really look at the last four years worth of point in time count statistics and to really work through some of the issues and figure out what kind of trends there were. And Wallace will be going into that a little bit later. Um, but again, uh, further studying, you know, with last year's point in time count, we were actually able to conduct several different sub reports that are really diving into what the data actually says to us um, in regards to the subpopulations of folks who are experiencing homelessness, whether they're veterans, families, youth under the age of 18, all of those kinds of things are very important for us to understand. Uh, go ahead to the next screen. And from there, I'm going to toss it over to Wallace, who understands numbers a lot better than I do. Um, she makes the pretty, or they make the pretty uh, graphs so that anybody can read them and actually understand what they're trying to tell us. So with that, I turn it over to Wallace. Thanks. Yeah, so as Laura was talking about, cleaner data has really been um, kind of the core focus of Partners in Care over the last year and a half. and. Um, be that through HMAS, through a point in time, um, and just kind of allowing when we have cleaner data, we can better analyze it and we can do more things with it. Um, so some of the different outcomes that I'm going to touch on, one of them is the dashboards. Um, so we have been working on pulling HMAS records um, and creating these monthly dashboards so that um, funders and invested community members and providers can really understand um, program exits in terms of capacity and in terms of the people that we're serving. Um, and this is something that we'll really be trying to get further in depth in 2021. So um, please keep um, tuned to see um, how they develop because we're really hoping to um, expand on them and, and get down into those little nitty gritty details of different aspects. So next slide, please. So one of the other outcomes is with our point in time count. Um, so this last year with our point in time count, we decided to release our one overall um, 36 pager with appendices um, overall report, um, but we really wanted to pull out those subpopulations and really be able to give them the time 
um, that they deserved and see how they differentiated from the overall point in time count population. And so with these, we talked with providers um, who work specifically with these subpopulations and interested community members. Um, so these were really a collaboration. It wasn't just partners in care pulling these together and releasing them. It was very much a community collaboration of what, what are the things that are really important for you and your population and how can we highlight that? So um, just some highlights when we looked at the veteran subpopulation, we could actually see that African American and Black individuals were overrepresented in the veteran population um, by 500% um, as compared to the overall population of Oahu. So we wouldn't have seen just how different this racial, um, racial overrepresentation was um, without delving further into the data. And then with sexual and gender minorities, so this was the first year that we asked our unsheltered population across the entire island, um, which is really amazing. So we really got to see um, how sexual and gender minorities are affected by homelessness um, in our unsheltered population. And we saw that 41% of the, the SGM population identifies as gender diverse. So either as transgender, gender nonconforming, and other gender, um, which is a, it's, it's really fascinating and, and amazing to kind of see that of the gender diversity of our population. And then we also saw that domestic violence, so a lifetime experience of domestic violence, and then also fleeing, um, so currently experiencing homelessness because they're fleeing domestic violence, was um, like drastically greater in our SGM population. So it was over three times greater um, for those who are sexual and gender minorities as it was to the overall um, point in time count population. Um, so that can definitely highlight some intersectionalities of, of, of what resources could look like and, and maybe need to be um, directed. And then with our Native Hawaiians, so Subreport. This is soon to be released, hopefully um, later this month. Um, but we could see that Native Hawaiians account for 18.5% of the um, homeless population, while in terms of Oahu, they only account for about 7.5%. Uh, so it's over double. They're they're over double represented within our homeless population. And then we also saw that um, Native Hawaiian, 56% of all the Native Hawaiians um, were repeaters. So this is looking at individuals who were counted um, in a point in time count anywhere from 2017 to 2020 within that four year span. Um, and this is much higher than the average when we looked at the overall point in time count population, about 37% of individuals um, or repeaters, so we're counted in multiple. Um, so the fact that over half of the Native Hawaiians counted um, were in multiple um, shows that they have long-term homelessness, um, more so than the average population. Um, next slide, please. So, and then the other outcome is being able with um, partners through MOUs, being able to use the data that we have um, and really use it in innovative and interesting ways. So this is um, a partnership that we had with UH Manoa in the city um, where we looked at four years of point in time count data um, for the unsheltered population. So 2017 to 2020 um, and from that we found 7,496 unique individuals um within that four-year period but then when we look at that repeater so this is how we were able to see and be able to track if people were counted in multiple um point in time counts we see that 19 percent of them are repeaters so this kind of shows that or doesn't show but it could indicate um that it may be that we'd more have an inflow rather than this perpetual cycle of staying in it of people are entering and then 
um, leaving that there's a constant um, flow into. Another interesting um, point that came out from this report was 42% had an existing HMIS record at the time of their first count. Um, so for all of these, we went into HMIS and tried to match everybody as much as possible um, from our point in time count to the HMIS system to really see um, how they communicated across both systems. Um, and then, but we can also see that the majority of that 42% weren't repeaters. So it's people who got into the system and then effectively left. And then the other important part to highlight is that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders account for, accounted for 54% of the population over the four years. Um, so this is also in line with what we found with our point in time count this year that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders are overrepresented within our homeless population. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and I was going to so, jump in here to oh, yeah. try and uh, uh, correlate this um, to everybody that's out there. So why does this application matter? Um, so as Wallace has described, you know, we've really dug deep into some of these numbers and uh, some of the results can actually make a difference in our community. So between 2019 and 2020 here, you see, we brought up the issue of pets. And you know, most of us know that, that a, a big portion of folks who are experiencing homelessness have found comfort in having their pets with them. Uh, some of those are one pet, some are 10 pets. Uh, and this makes it very difficult to uh, find resources that will accept not only a, a person, um, but also their pet. And although we really want to encourage people to be able to have their pets with them, sometimes that's not possible to help them move through our shelter system and into housing if they do have the pets. And so we really wanted to say, you know, look at this issue and say, what do we need to do to respond to these kinds of numbers and the frequency with which people do have pets. Um, I mean, I own two pets, I love my, my fur babies, and so I wouldn't want to leave them, and they are a big source of comfort um, to me. And so as a community, we need to look at these numbers and say, what do we need to do to assist folks who do have pets getting into shelter, into safe environments, while still making sure that the, the safety of others in the shelters are being addressed um, in regards to having pets around them, whether it's uh, making sure that they have all their shots, making sure that they're well behaved, and possibly even making sure that allergies are not an issue in a shelter if there are pets available there. And I'll toss that back to Wallace. Yeah, exactly what Laura highlighted. Um, data is great, and I can stare at numbers and make pretty charts and make pretty reports um, as long as they keep paying me. Um, but it really only matters when it's applied. Um, so this is really why we wanted to, to single out pets, because for the past two years in our unsheltered population, we ask if individuals have pets, but we never really talk about it much further than that and highlight it. Um, and so I think these are some really great uh, statistics of when you're looking at our unsheltered population, um, you know, that 29% this last year are pet owners. And then if you look at that, of that, of those 355 individuals, 50% of them are repeaters. Um, so we can see that our population of pet owners are the ones that are, that are also repeating as well. Um, but then we can also see where, you know, the majority are living in region seven. Um, and then there's 10% of pet owners in 2020 and 13% in 2019 were counted in all, um, all three and all four. So they were counted every single time. Um, so that may be because they can't get into a shelter that allows for a pet. Um, so that is actually keeping them where they are. Um, so next slide, please. So this is another way to kind of look at that, that pet data. 
So if we look at um, those two little yellow houses on a, um, down in the bottom of Region 1 on Oahu, those are the two pet-friendly shelters that we have on island. Then when we look across of our seven regions, um, the number in bold is the percent of the population for that region of everyone that was counted um, that are pet owners. So we can see that only 9% of those counted in Region 1 were pet owners, but they have two of the shelters. Um, and then when we look at Region 7, 24% of all individuals counted in Region 7 were pet owners. Um, region 4, 24% of the population in Region 4 are pet owners. Um, so having a shelter in Region 1, so we can kind of see how um, when we look at it in this way, if these individuals may be repeating um, or in different regions and they have a pet, it may make it more difficult um, for them to access shelter if that shelter is far away. Um, and that's what I got from the data side. Okay, and then we'll toss it over to Maud. Thank you so much, Maud, for joining us. Aloha. So um, I have a couple of slides, which the, um, the data on it is not what I um, was trying to focus on, but rather the fact that um, we have been uh, asking our HMIS admin to, to put together a number of dashboards. Um, so you can go to the first slide. So, um, and these dashboards are uh, allowing us to take a longitudinal view. Sometimes when you look at the individual, maybe month to month or quarterly data, um, it doesn't make as much sense as if, uh, as when you put it into a graph and then you see, oh, okay, this is what's happening. So our goal is to, and by the way, you can access all of this information. All our reports are on the website, bpghawaii.org. That's bpghawaii.org. So um, you can take a look at it anytime. Um, and so what we're hoping to do with these dashboards is to uh, help us inform decision making the same way that um, PIP is doing. So, for example, the first one here is a length of stay. How long are pe people staying um, in the system, either in um, outreach, in shelter, all these different uh, resources, and um, how long is it taking them to leave the system? Um, go on. Um, and also, how many households are in the month of active household? So, one of the things that um, we want to see is um, if people are staying, say, 100 days, um, by um, reducing that length of stay to perhaps 50 days, would we serve more people with the same resources uh, because we're moving them through the system twice as fast? And so it kind of gives us an indication if we did that. Um, at what rate would we have to do it in order to reach the point of um, uh, where we're saying we're ending homelessness, we're reaching functional zero, we're at the point at which we have enough resources to meet anybody that enters the system within 30 days. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're looking at. And um, we see that we have quite a ways to go. <laughs> but we're now tracking that and um, trying to present it in a way that is meaningful, where we can actually say, okay, we put these kinds of resources, refugee housing resources, or do we need more shelters? Do we need less shelters? Are our shelter beds adequate? Because we'll just, we reduce the length of stays, we can push through twice as many people. So that is the kind of thing we're looking at. Go to the next slide, please. We're also looking at uh, the next one as well, at um, the performance measures. Um, this performance measure is successful exits from street outreach projects. So we did find it valuable to break it down by island. Uh, our situation is unique in that we have um, three separate islands, um, three separate counties. 
and um, each one operates, um, we, we operate with the same policies, um, but um, in, in actual carrying out, we have different resources. So there's different um, nuances in every county. So we want to be able to identify that. And so, and see as a continuum of care across three islands, how do we plan and what do we do um, and how do we meet the needs of each unique island and see that uh, we have success in every area. And so uh, we found it very beneficial to break the data down by island. Okay, next slide. Um, next one is just some monthly trends. And then the next slide, this is uh, metric 70.1, exits to permanent housing destinations. And so this is, this speaks to the extent to which clients that exit to permanent housing and the ability of permanent housing projects to um, retain clients in housing. And you see it's pretty high. So um, that's a good thing because it speaks to recidivism and those people falling back. So we're not, we're not only trying to measure where we're at, but we're trying to measure over time where are we headed and how are we doing. Okay, next slide. Um, and then there's some monthly trends. And then the next slide, metric 7B.2, change in exit to or retention of permanent housing. And so this speaks to as well, um, how long people are retaining housing. So it's a, it's a pretty high rate. So um, the next slide, um, the next one, um, you know, I'm just uh, quickly going through these because you can access them at the uh, website and um, have time to do it, um, to really review it well. Um, you can go to the next slide. These are um, reports that we get uh, monthly broken down by island that tells us a number of, um, gives us a lot of information. Um, the permanent housing exit rate, exits to permanent housing and the total exit. So we can see out of people who are exiting the system, where how many are going actually going to permanent housing. And so, um, you know, we can break it down. Um, and then I, I don't think I have it included there, but it is broken down by um, agency. So uh, for example, in uh, my agency, we, we review it monthly to see, um, Sometimes it just tells me somebody hasn't done their work and entered the information because I know people have exited. So it's kind of a good check. We we say, okay, um, did, did you enter the information properly and on a timely basis into each of my yes. And, and of course, this is one of the things we're trying to emphasize as well. Timeliness, 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 72 hours, um, get that information in so that what we're looking at is not, um, old data, but it's real data on time. And we can, um, you know, for example, we can say to the funder, you know, this is um, what is actually happening right now, not what we, we think or, we, you know, because we uh, try to really adhere to those timeliness standards that these are up to date and it's real time. So this kind of gives us, gives us good data on, um, what's happening, and then we try to look for trends during COVID, did the, did the um, exit rate go down, and try to look immediately so we can connect um, events that are happening in our community and see if it's being reflected um, negatively or positively in our um, what we are doing. Um, and I think the last slide is um, just the Permanent housing exit rate comparison. Um, and um, so, yeah, this is this is um, part of what we're trying to do with the data. I'm always excited about data. Not many people share my enthusiasm. I don't understand why. <laughs> because I just think that it, um, it, it just helps us to plan for the future. Now, you know, I, I think of the many years that we spent collecting data where we just did it because um, 
we had to report to the state, we had to report to HUD, and it was such a drudgery because it was always, okay, something that was in the past, if we did it, it's done, and here's what we did. And so with, with our um, current HMIS system, we're able to get ahead of the game and now use it to inform our future planning. And that to me is exciting, um, coming from a place where we just dreaded getting everything together to this place now where we can use it to inform our future and help us determine um, what housing resources we need and uh, in fact, we are doing a good job or not, or doing what we say we uh, are doing. So that's it, and I'll turn it over to Lori. Hi, everyone. So as I said earlier, I'm the Director of Housing and Human Concerns for the County of Maui, and um, I have, um, a history of being the administrator of the homeless programs office um, at the Department of Human Services as well. So uh, I work here in uh, the Department of Housing and Human Concerns from 2007 until 2011, and then uh, moved to Oahu to assume the role as HPO administrator. So one of the things that I want to do today is to just um, hopefully we have um, not only providers on this, this um, session, but also people who might be interested in providing funding. Um, the, the County of Maui has uh, a long history of providing funding to many nonprofit efforts, uh, and homelessness is one of them. Um, in aggregate, our, our county grants um, about $17 million uh, from our department to nonprofits in the community. To do work uh, in terms of homelessness, I think our total funding um, is around ten million dollars. So one of the things that I've learned um, over the years, as I've transitioned from this role to HPO administrator and back again to this role, is that it really helps to understand the system of care that has been developed. Um, you know, years and years and years ago, when um, I first started learning about homelessness and how to address homelessness and how to end homelessness, uh, we used to count encounters. So homeless outreach workers would, I guess, use a clicker or some other way to count encounters. And an encounter was anytime they came upon an unsheltered person and they offered a business card or offered a, a pouch with them, hygiene supplies or offered a sandwich, um, that that little interaction with that person was, uh, was clicked in as an encounter. And I remember um, when I first moved to the homeless programs office, looking at looking at outputs uh, that said, how many encounters did you have this year? And agencies were reporting having had 140,000 encounters. Um, I, I couldn't tell from that whether it was 140,000 encounters with the same person or with 10 people or whether it was with um, 3,000 people or anything. So, and that was in 2011. So we've come a long way as a system of care to start um, really focusing on performance measurements rather than simply counting outputs. So I might have given out, you know, 3 million band-aids, but how did, how did those 3 million band-aids translate into ending somebody's homelessness? So we've gone from counting encounters to uh, actually uh, counting the number of people for whom outreach has resulted in uh, permanent housing or the number of people who've um, been administered a VI spadat so they can be entered into coordinated entry or the number of um, uh, documents, the number of people who have been helped to obtain the documents necessary to achieve permanent housing outcomes. So that's, you know, in a big way, that's sort of where our system has gone over the past 10 years uh, to a more, to a more, a deeper and a more meaningful uh, look at what the actual outcomes are for people who are um, in situations of homelessness. So I'll tell you that 
if I didn't have an understanding and an appreciation for what that larger system was like, it would be very challenging for me to be a funder. Um, it's very, I think, for some maybe private foundations and private funders, it's very easy to be swayed by anecdotal stories about individual homeless, individ, you know, individual homeless people who've been helped by, you know, agency A, agency B, and agency C. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but I still think that we do better if we understand as funders, if we understand the big picture and we understand how our funding can help parlay resources from other uh, funding sources into getting people into housing because we have to be focused on ending homelessness, not on making people more comfortable or, um, you know, um, extending somebody's unsheltered conditions because it makes us feel better. So, as funders, I and the prize understand the process so that you can make decisions based not only on the data that Maud was showing and um, Wallace had showed us earlier, is how does this money that I have to offer contribute to making this existing system stronger? Now, is there room within the existing system for funders to try new things? Absolutely, absolutely. That's what pilot projects are for. So if there's a if there's a pilot project that's to be proposed where it's maybe doesn't fit exactly within the existing system of care, but offers a sort of a different way of doing things um, that we can get support around this one pilot project effort. If it's if it's based on evidence, if we can work toward an evidence-based program, sure, I think that's a good risk for funders to take. Um, but I don't believe that funders in general should be really nilly about how to offer funding um, to the homeless service system. I think that we can do ourselves and the larger system a lot of damage by not being aware of what service systems are there. So um, in my work here in Maui County, I've talked to a lot of people about needing to understand how funding comes from HUD and what that HUD funding is for, using state and county money to supplement those efforts so that uh, we are still eligible to receive HUD funding. Because if we, I mean, we could, in the county of Maui, choose a whole different model of work and of care, right? We can just decide, well, we don't, we don't want to have a COC. We don't want to deal with a COC. We don't want to be Part of bridging the gap anymore. We just sort of want to do our own thing because we're smarter than everybody and we just do so much better with all of these constraints. And we can decide that on our own. But the trade off of doing that is that we have to go without that fundamental support from HUD, right? Which is money and guidance about what best practices have worked in other parts of the country. So it's not it, uh, foregoing that structure. The evidence, the guidance from HUD is not something that I would encourage any community to do. So that's why we have to understand what that is in order to um, utilize whatever resources we have at a local level to facilitate more discussion, facilitate better services, but all within the foundation and the framework of what we are already doing. So um, I didn't have a chance to look at everyone who's on the um, on the session this morning, uh, but if anybody is part of a, a funding collaborative or is thinking about making donations, large donations that would impact programs, um, I would suggest you learn about the big system before you make those decisions. Learn about what how how the grantee is working with the existing service system, where they are. Um, and how your funding can make that system better and more effective and how you can check 
on the effectiveness of that service system by circling back, look, um, getting access to HMIS data and analysis and seeing whether your intention is being met by the agencies receiving the funding that you are offering. Okay, I, I'm, I'll, I'll close with that and then we can have, I think, uh, uh, Morgan, we can have like 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, that sounds great. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and submit those to the Q&A, the bottom right hand box on your screens. I believe we had one about pets that Wallace has answered. Well, we're waiting to see if there's any other questions. Um, one of the things that I'd like to just throw out there is that despite COVID and the real restrictions that we've had over the last eight months, uh, you know, the, the data that Maud was showing earlier shows that there's still so much work that all of you folks who are providers out there have actually still been doing and doing fairly well despite all of the restrictions. So uh, that's something that, you know, is very important for us to show in the data so that despite all of that, despite this crisis, we as a system continue to work hard and uh, props to everybody who, who is part of that system that's made that work still possible in this crazy new world that we live in. Thanks, Laura. It looks like we have one question here. Um, what is the best data to influence legislative funding and how can PIC produce these simple graphs to show impacts and needs. Um, in terms of creating graphs, I mean, I just need uh, to know what data point we're gonna be talking about. Um, in terms of influencing legislative funding, I guess that it really depends on, on what, um, what you're trying to target. Um, and I think, um, Betty, that's something we can definitely talk about in advocacy of, you know, like looking at what are our legislative priorities and is there um, HMIS, HMIS or point in time count data that can then back up kind of these legislative priorities, um, be they with PIC or be they with BTG. Um, and that we can then take to the ledge and, you know, and have that data to back up what, what we're really trying to, to do. I hope that answers that. Yeah, and then um, to kind of circle in with another question that's kind of been answered or uh, asked uh, regarding like statewide data, that is something that we really want to work on. Um, I, I know we're going to be discussing, you know, getting statewide data points out uh, uh, with uh, our data committee. And then we're also looking at, uh, we've had some preliminary talks, and again, we don't know exactly what the point in time count is going to look at, but we've uh, uh, been working together with BTG to, to make sure our questions, at least some of the questions the, the are asked exactly the same way on our point in time count. So it is easier to get those kind of data points that are statewide. Um, so that is very important, um, and we continue to work on, on figuring out how that can be done. And then just real quickly on the pet situation, we do know that there are some other shelters that um, oftentimes uh, accept pets, but that seems to change um, every once in a while. And so the, the ones that we pointed out are more the, the basic ones that have always taken pets, um, but there. And that also brings up another point is when we share our data and there's things that that we miss uh, because they're not part of our system for whatever reason, uh, it, data is, an, uh, is a way to bring in more uh, stakeholders that can help us improve our data. And that could be as simply as figuring out there is another shelter that provides um, housing for someone with pets and making sure that that's shared throughout the system. So another good point of how data can help us. Thanks, Laura. Another question on here is, 
Um, what picture do you believe Maui needs to understand? Not sure I understand what the question is. Tasha, do you think you could elaborate a little more on what you mean by picture? And then another question is, um, what data does PIC and BTG have that is specific to early childhood? I, I'll talk about early childhood just to say that I don't believe we have anything specific, so it has to go back to um, gathering the data. And um, generally, we would, this would be generated by, um, say, organizations, um, uh, organizations serving a particular age group or particular um, specific um, uh, targeted groups, such as um, youth um, exiting um, foster care. So generally, um, we get those questions in our individual um, COCs. We, we call them chapters. There's, we have three of them, you know, one on each island. And then from there, then we um, have discussions um, about is there a, um, a chart or dashboard or information uh, that we can put into a report that we should be gathering. So then we we may have to restructure an intake form to be sure that we gather that information. But uh, right now we don't have uh, BTG doesn't have any specific, but we are flexible enough that we can always create something. Um, but it has to start, of course, with the gathering data, uh, the gathering information first. Thanks, Maude. Did we have anything on the partners in care side of early childhood? As well? we, we do not have a lot of that information, but one of the things that we have started doing is uh, really looking at youth, not early childhood, but looking at the, um, you know, either emancipated youth or youth that are under 18 uh, that may be out on the streets on their own. and. And those are some of the, the subpopulations that we would like to dive more into. Um, a lot of that information is program level. Uh, and that's one of the drawbacks of data, especially with the point in time count and intake uh, paperwork. You know, it would be wonderful to ask 300 questions, um, but then we may lose folks along the way. And so we need to figure out a way to capture a lot of that information. And I think early childhood is a very important um, part of that. And I think that's where I, I know Toby Portner and Bree are on the, on, uh, the uh, conference this week, uh, representing Department of Education and making those connections also with Chris Jackson and the youth or the early childhood programs, making sure they're part of the discussion so that when uh, these kind of things arise, and we can actually uh, dive deeper into figuring out what the needs are for that population that we can actually address them with um, experienced people. But yeah, I think we need to improve on that. Thanks, Laura. Um, to elaborate more on the question, Lori, before about the big picture. So you mentioned that funders need to understand the big picture before deciding which homeless programs to fund. Um, in reference to funding from HUD, maximizing local funding sources. So could you elaborate a little more on that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. So um, what I mean by that is, um, you know, uh, policymakers and the people who make decisions about uh, using uh, taxpayer funded money in order to grant funds to agencies that do a very specific piece of work in the larger homeless system uh, would really benefit from understanding what the larger system of care looks like so that um, they're not um, unduly or unintentionally undermining sort of the larger goals that uh, the system needs to work on, which is, for example, ending homelessness. So I don't 
I don't want to fund a, an agency that is simply going to prolong somebody's homelessness, right? I want to work and, and provide funding and support to an agency who's working in the same vein as everyone else uh, to end someone's homelessness. And I think that those um, having an understanding and an appreciation for what the larger service system is committed to doing, and then and then trying to figure out, okay, if I make a decision to fund this particular agency, and they're doing something that's totally contrary to what everybody else is doing, how am I making things better? Or am I making things better, right? Or is this um, a poor use of that funding? And I think by taking a step backwards, um, getting informed about what that larger system of care looks like and how it operates and what its what its objectives are will really um, be informative to funders and and help inform their decisions about where to make those funding investments. Thank you, Lori. Okay, um, there's a couple more questions, so we'll see how many we can get to in the next. Uh, three or four minutes. There's one that says, so for each county, what do you all see as the number of units of affordable rentals currently needed? Would like to try that one first. I'll, I'll start. Um, so we recently had um, uh, a statewide housing um, report conducted by SMS and uh, for a long time, we heard the number of um, housing units that were needed in Maui County to be about 14,000 a year um, in order to get us to where we need it. And that's since uh, been reduced to, I think, 6,000 a year. So um, there's been a reduction in the, in the projected need. Uh, we know from income, um, from income studies and Basically, by living in this age of COVID and seeing that seeing its impact on our families and, our, and individuals here in Maui County, that the need is much greater for uh, for rental housing for people who earn sixty percent and below of area median income. And so, um, I I believe that that's our largest need in Maui County right now. There's still there's still a market for single family homes and things like that, but we're really looking at um, multi family. Uh, apartments and things of that nature that are affordable to people at 60% and below of EMI. Uh, so that's what we we're trying to very hard to focus on developing more of those projects. Uh, I know for uh, the county of Honolulu, um, it's it's probably, I think of the latest one, the report that I saw was about 20,000. And it's going to be very difficult to see what will happen after COVID um, or once the moratorium on evictions uh, ends to see what the overarching need is after that. Um, and I think that's an important thing that we need to recognize is that along with people possibly use it, losing their units, we're also looking at landlords who have suffered greatly, um, possibly because of non-payment of rental and so they're putting, it's not just at this point, uh, the folks who are experiencing homelessness, it's also the landlords that their livelihoods have been greatly affected. And if they have to shut down their rental units um, or keep them empty or keep them filled with people who are not able to pay the rent, uh, you know, there's the possibility of that number going up significantly. But it's always a lot more than we, we think, I think. Okay, thanks, Laura and Lori. Thank you, everyone, all of our panelists for joining this session, um, for presenting on the importance of data um, and where it really leads our continuums. I'm going to stop this session here so we can all have a minute to join into the closing plenary. I'm actually just going to, I just sent the link to all attendees to get to that closing plenary session. Um, yeah, thank you all so much, and we'll see you there. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks, everyone. Bye.